Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tier 3 Cohort 3 FY25 SIG Application Technical Assistance Support Webinar. I am going to be letting in a few people, so if, you, if I pause a little bit, that's why. So my name is Monique Sullivan, and I know most of you know who I am, but for those of you who don't, um, I am the Continuous School Improvement uh, Coordinator for the Department of Education. And although I'm listed under ESCA, I also work with the assessment team under Maine's model of school support, uh, which falls under several statutes of the ESSA statute, but specifically title section 1111 and section 1003. Section 1111 is uh, where the requirements are for the school improvement plans are. And then section 1003 is the funding tied to schools that receive school improvement funds. And I have our mission, vision, and strategic priorities for the Maine Department of Education. And this is the driving force behind all the work that we do at the department and the interactions that we have with schools across the state. So today's objectives are to understand cohort two, tier three with support status, be informed about all identification notifications, understand, or at least begin to understand some of the FY25 uh, SIG requirements or application requirements, uh, substantial approval requirements, final approval requirements, and then um, understand, understand tier three CSI requirements, and then talk a little bit about the memo of understanding. And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end, planning on having some time at the end for you to ask any questions uh, regarding summer planning, regarding any of the uh, FY25, the SIG application for the year FY24-25. And I just want to say up front that we're going to have some more trainings. I only have an hour today, so I tried to keep it brief, but more of like an overview for the FY25 application. And hopefully you can ask any questions or we'll have some additional training later on as we get closer to the start of the school year. So the first um, kind of idea or area is the identifications. And I think I explained this to you guys um, at the last meeting on May 16th but I wanted to go a little bit more in detail into it. And then I also want to talk about just all the tier identifications so you can get a better idea of how um, the identifications works around across the state. So identification status is for three years when you're identified for tier three. And this cohort was actually identified for tier three, as, not for tier three supports, but was identified as a tier three school in FY22-23 you would have gotten a notification in May of 23, 2023. And, um, but because of these schools, you guys were outside of the 5%, you did not receive any um, CSI funding support or school leadership coach, which we are counting as year one of your planning year. So that you had no section 1003 funds. Fast forward to um, this year, or, or finishing up 23, 24, and we're moving into 24, 25, you have been identified for tier three with supports. So now you're gonna be getting section 1003 funds and you're also gonna be getting school leadership coaching. And then, but you have to have two years of consecutive um, not meeting tier three identification status. So um, year two is gonna be FY 24, 25, and then year three will be 25, 26. And then you'll be eligible to exit uh, this should say, I apologize, I need to fix this. Um, this should actually say fall of 2026, not fall of 2025. I apologize. I will fix that. Um, to eligible to exit tier three or convert to another status, tier one or tier three with more supports. Um, and the reason why I need to change that is because it can't be the fall of 2025 because you need two consecutive years. So you need to finish out 24, 25. You need to do 24, 5, 26. And if both of those are no for um, tier three identification, 
criteria, then you'd be able to exit in the fall of 2026. And I will fix that um, before this um, slide deck goes out to you guys. So again, tier three exit criteria is two consecutive years of not having all students experiencing challenges in all indicators. And in the May 16th webinar, I kind of gave some examples of that. And I am waiting for all of the different uh, Zoom meetings I've been doing over the last couple of weeks for identifications. I'm waiting for those to get uploaded to the YouTube Maine's YouTube channel or Maine Department of Education's YouTube channel. So once that gets noted, once that gets, I get notified that that's all ready, I will send you both of the slide decks for this one and for um, May 16th, and then the links to the two recordings. And anything else, like if there was any kind of documents that I referenced, I'll send those to you. And I will send that through Grants for Me notification system. Um, all of the applications for FY25 have been uploaded to Grants for Me. You should have gotten a notification once that goes live, you get notifications of that. Uh, but if you don't have that, you can just send me an email. I can check up on that for you. And then lastly on this page, I just wanted to mention that Maine's Consolidated State Plan, which is where Maine's model school support um, the whole the whole piece of that, is actually, we got it uploaded, the newest version or the amended version, it, the amended approved version um, is on the website and you can find it at this and I can put that in the link. I can put that in the chat. If you want to read this, um, I'll be honest with you, it's 197 pages. So you might wanna do a search and find if you're looking for something in particular. And then the next slide is more for your information. So I wanted you guys to understand why it's taking so long to make identifications and why your superintendent might be getting a tier three letter here and a tier one letter here. And then there's a variation in between. It's because right now we have 12 identification note, identifications right now in FY23. We have the tier three that were able to exit um, with no support. Those were the ones that were identified um, back in 1819. Then we have the ones that were identified 1819, they were able to exit tier three, but they now have tier one support. So there are 23 of those. Then we had tier threes that were eligible to exit because they were identified at FY 1819, um, but they were unable to exit because they did not meet the exit criteria. So there are 13 of those. Now remember, this is all notifications that I have to send out separately to the superintendent, the ESCA coordinator and the school. So it does take quite a bit of time to do all that. Um, and then tier three, um, these are schools that were um, identified for tier three supports but they're not eligible to exit because they haven't done three, they haven't completed three years in tier three. So we had a 20 student, a 20 schools that were identified in 22, 23 for tier three with support. And so they're just finishing up their first year. So they have another two years. Then there's the schools that were um, identified last year uh, for, they were identified, they're in the same cohort as this group here. Um, but they actually, um, when we ran the numbers, they had a no for meeting tier three identification criteria. So they're technically, they just, they're in their third year, first year of tier three, but they are not getting supports because they're not, um, they're not, they're saying no for that. So they need one, they basically need one more year to be able to exit um, tier three. And then tier three identified with supports this year, um, and so these are you got um, your you guys and then two feeders. I think I, you guys know who those are. And then tier three um, met criteria and FY 23, 24, but they're not going to get support because they're outside of the five percent and there are 29 of them. And then tier two, they're not eligible to exit because they're they were just identified last year and it's a three years. So they still have two more years that they have to do that cycle before they can be eligible to exit. Tier one, uh, these were schools that were identified in 1819. Um, they are able to exit or were able to exit. And so we exited 35 of them uh, because they didn't have any student populations that were experiencing challenges across all their indicators. Um, tier one, unable to exit. Um, they were able to, they, had, they were eligible to exit, but they still had student populations that were experiencing challenges. So they could not exit their tier one status. 
um, and there are 69 of those. And then tier one, we had we identified um, tier one schools last year, 22, 23. They have to do it for three years. And so they're only in their first year. So they still have two more years and that's why they're not eligible to exit. And then the last um, group is the tier one schools that were just identified this year. Um, there are 36 of them and they obviously can't exit because they just got identified. But I think it's really important to understand the difference between eligible to exit and not in versus eligible to exit versus um, unable to exit. So eligible means that you're, you can exit, you've done the three years or your school's been in that status. Um, you may not be able to exit status just because you're not eligible, you haven't done the three years. So to, um, so you have to have, and then tier one, you have to have three years of meeting the criteria and, and tier three, you have to have um, two years of meeting the exit criteria. And I didn't put all this in there to confuse you guys. I just want you to understand that this is a very nuanced, very multifaceted um, identification system. And so it takes a little while to get it all through. Um, and typically we wouldn't do identifications two years in a row, but because of the US Department of Education required us to do it last year and this year, um, we have some schools that are kind of like, they're getting a lot of notifications because of that. We're hoping to some in the next couple of years to get that straightened out and we'll just be back on a three year cycle. Okay, um, and then now we're just gonna move into the, uh, the FY25 SIG application. I didn't go really too much in the detail because um, it is June and, sorry, it's not June, it's May, it feels like June. And um, I just wanted to do more of an overview and then leave time for questions if you have those. But before we do substantial approval, I just wanted to review that um, in the May 16th meeting, we talk, um, I talked about the FY25 SIG app planning grant. We know that we're very, behind, very delayed in getting these identifications out. So we wanted these schools to have, we wanted you guys to have a little bit of funding to be able to do some activities or some work over the summer. Unlike the other tier three schools that with support, they already have funding from the FY23 and 24 applications where you guys do not. So that's why we provided this funding. All that's all set up in grants for me, like I said. So you should be able to start working on that. Just for the summer planning, you, you have the application, but you don't need to complete all the same pieces that you would do for the regular application. Um, <clears throat> parts of the, you'll have to do the school leadership team, but in re relation to summer planning, June, July, and August. Um, and then again, I had talked about what to fill out in the um, strategic plan section um, three, and then section four, your budget has to be tied to your summer activities. And that SMART goal as well, you wanna make sure it's tied to the, to the summer activities. And then um, again, if you want this, it's in the bit, um, May 16th. I'm hoping to have that ready. <laughs> I hope I was hoping to have it ready this week. Um, we'll see um, how long it takes to get all that uploaded to, um, to YouTube so that it'll be available to you guys. Uh, okay, so now moving to the start of the school year, FY24-25, there are two pieces of the application. There's substantial approval, and if there are any ESCA coordinators on here, then you know what that means. You have to have substantial approval to have some um, ability to obligate your funds. Um, and so like, if you wanted to do something in August, but you don't get substantial approval until October, you technically can't use the money for that. So that's why we want you to get your substantial approval in as quickly as possible. So for substantial approval, you just need to have everything completed in section one, um, school, the leadership and development team. So you're going to add on to what you've already done for summer. So right now you might just have the summer, June, July, and August. You might just have those, meet. you would have those meetings, um, your leadership team. And then when you get ready to submit for substantial approval, you'll put all your meetings for 24, 25. You'll make sure that your uh, leadership team was part of your plan development. And that's where the, and I'll have a little, I have a couple screenshots that I can show you that. And then required documents, you need to upload your completed and updated CNA school-wide plan. For some of you, you already have a school-wide plan. If you operate a Title I um, <clears throat> school-wide program, you just wanna make sure that all your data, your goals and everything are all updated because your CNA, your school-wide plan 
is the backbone of your strategic plan in your school, uh, school improvement application. And then you're going to want to upload your signed and reviewed FY24-25 memorandum of understanding. And I'm going to go over that um, also. Um, and Teresa, I'll answer your question in a second. Um, and then um, related documents, you're going to want to share the link to your leadership team meetings, agendas, and minutes. Um, we, um, as a form of just knowing what's going on in transparency, this was some feedback we received from the U.S. Department of Education when they did their monitoring visit last year, that we need to be more transparent about what's happening um, with our school improvement funds. And so we're asking that schools, um, rather than upload like each, you can do that. You can upload each of your leadership team meeting agendas or another alternative is many of you use Google Docs. So you could just use a shared link and put that in the related documents. And then that just always keeps the most updated version. So you just click on that link. I can go in and see, okay, they had their meeting, the last meeting May 5th, here are their minutes. And then it just runs through the entire um, agenda. So it just shows you when you don't have to keep uploading your, um, your uh, meeting agendas. You can just have a shared link um, to that. So it'll always be up to date. And then we are recommending, well, I'm not recommending, but upload your school profile. Um, if you go to the school profile page, which I gave you the link in the uh, letter notifying you of the status, um, and you can download that as a PDF and recommend putting that in your related documents. Actually, not really. I would like you to do it now because um, good or bad, there's a lot of changes that happen in schools. And what we're finding is that when a new person comes on or somebody, um, a new administrator comes in, they have no idea where things are. We have, you know, a lot of people don't know that they had school profiles from last year. Nobody can find the ones from 18, 19. So um, just a good idea to put in here as um, a place to store the documents. And then lastly, you really need to update your address book. And I, I have a slide on that. It is important to remember, and I already mentioned that if you don't have substantial approval, you cannot, um, you can't have anything happen before that substantial approval date. So we recommend trying to get it in, get that up, get the substantial approval part in by August 1st, if possible. Um, but you guys have a little bit of planning money. So if it's a little bit delayed, that's probably not a bad, it's not, you know, it's not a horrible thing, but if you're doing anything significant, um, you're going to want to get that, um, that in. We're hoping to have all of the, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but we're hoping to have all of the rest of the funding um, in by July 1st. So that should help as well. And then Teresa asked about, is the SIG application in Grants For Me? Yes, it is for, um, we've uploaded it and made it available to the 18 schools, the, um, the 16 that are identified and then the two feeder. And also, um, I want to make sure that I know I had a question that came up afterward by a different group. And um, I just want to make sure that people understand the feeder are schools that are not don't have main through year assessments, like a pre-K three school. That would be considered a feeder school. So if you have like a four, five school and you that's a feeder to a middle school, it's not going to be considered a fetal a feeder because it has two grade levels. It has four and five. And those four or five are already going to have their own identification because they administer the main three-year assessment. It has to be two years of main three-year assessment. So I had a principal say, well, that doesn't make sense. And he was confused. And I said, no, because your school is a, a four or five, or it was a three, four, or five school. And I said, so they're going to have their own identification. If it were a pre-K2 or a K2 or a K3, then that's better because there's only one grade that test or it has the assessment. So there's not two years worth of data or two grade levels of data, not two years of data, two grade levels of data. Um, I'm gonna come back to, there's a couple of questions um, in, uh, in the chat. So the last one, again, I talked about this before, you wanna go into your update, your address book. Um, this is really gonna be your um, SAU authorized representative. A lot of times it's your, it defaults to your superintendent, um, sometimes it's the business manager and sometimes it's another designee. So that person's going to go in and set the roles for everybody. They're going to set 
the roles for the principal. They're going to set the roles for the um, for the leadership team because they can have viewing rights, um, so they can see what's happening. And then I put this link into the chat. I'll put this link in the chat. This is um, a guide that oh there it is um, that kind of explains how to do all that. So if you have a new for someone that's not familiar with how to set up the address book in um, in grants for me, this would help. And as I said at the last meeting, May 16th, uh, really try to use your ESCA coordinator. They're very familiar with this. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna get back to, I see some of those questions. Some of you may not be seeing your application because if your SAU uh, authorized representative didn't go in and give you a role, you're not going to see it. So you need to, I, I forgot to mention that too. The FY25 SIG application is not connected to the ESA consolidated application. It is a separate application. So your authorized SA, your SAU authorized representative needs to go in and set roles for everyone. So that's why you're not going to see it. That's like, Jenny, you're not going to see it because if whoever is the authorized, I don't know if it's, um, if it's Jake, but it you um, that person has to go in and set the roles for everyone or their designee has to go in and set the roles for them. That's why a lot of times we recommend that the SAU authorized representative, they have to go in initially and then they might pick a couple other people to be their designee to do this work in the future. But that's why you're not seeing because um, the SAU authorized representative, which is the super defaults to the superintendent, um, hasn't set up those roles yet. So that's something you'll need to have that person do. Monique, <clears throat> sorry to, to jump in. I am that person for Lewiston and I still don't see it. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, we can, I'll look at, um, I can look a little bit. Um, I have time at the end here. I'll try to no hurry problem. up a little bit. Just want, so I can just look at it. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. And then, um, just required documents. So the way that grants for me is set up right now, it has required documents and it has related documents. Um, those right now, they kind of default to the same place. Um, your required documents are in one section and your related documents are kind of down at the bottom, but it's, it all kind of comes to the same section here. So you want to make sure you have your school-wide plan uploaded, uh, the most up-to-date. That means your data has to be as, as most current as you can. Um, and then your signed MOU, um, which I will talk about. And then the agendas and minutes, those can go to your into the related document section. And um, again, you can just put a link in there to a shared document that just has like a running agenda and minutes for your leadership team meetings. Um, and then for final approval, I'm just going to spend just a very little time on this because we will provide some more support as we get closer to the start of the school year. But you want to have all your boxes checked, all the boxes with asterisks completed. Um, you want to make sure your budget is complete as possible with planned expenses. We're really trying to avoid for lack of a better term, being Christmas, we really want these sick funds to be planned based on your action steps, your growth areas, your identified resource inequities. We don't just want this to be kind of like a bank account. Hell, we'll just pull money. We'll just we'll just pull money from our um, sick account to pay for this. We really want it to be very strategic. Um, and like I said, the remaining allocation hopefully should be um, added by like seven one. We're Hopefully that so you should get all your money by 7-1. Um, and then related documents, you want to update as necessary. So if you're going to be planning on hiring an outside consultant, you want to make sure those contracts are in there. They're signed contracts, um, their purchase service agreement. If you're like going to be doing um, work with a responsive classroom just for your particular school, you want to make sure all that's in there. Um, if you're attending any conferences or planning on it, you want to have some information in there. You want to have your travel policy. Um, and then again, you want to make sure that that link to your LT meetings is valid or that it's updated. Um, and again, you want to make sure that there are no costs or that remember that you can't get reimbursement for anything until the application is in approved status. I'm just going to try to run through this a little quicker. Um, and then again, allowable uses. This is a little bit of a... Um, review from the last meeting, but the whole purpose of SIG money is to build, help build capacity so that when, um, you know, when you do exit, this work can continue after that. You know, it won't be dependent on the funding. 
So there's really two main purposes of the SIG funds, and that is to help um, with a functional operation of your leadership team, any trainings associated with that, any meetings that are outside of the collective bargaining agreements, and then professional development that are tied to your CNA, your school-wide plan, and you need them. You need to do you need to do professional development to be able to implement that um, the strategic plan so the SIG funds can be used to pay for that. And again, it's capacity building, shared leadership and capacity building. Uh, we don't want all this to go away when you exit and the SIG funding um, is discontinued for, for the school. We want to be able to build that capacity and continue on um, that continuous school improvement journey. And then real quickly here, um, the tier, basically the tier three requirements are the signed memo of understanding, which I'll show on the next slide. Um, you want, you have to attend the tier three principal coach meetings. They're the third Wednesday of the month. They're from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, we're really trying to make them uh, based on the needs of the schools. So they, they have morphed a little bit over the last year. Um, and then, um, so really, I just say look at the grant requirements. We talk about grant requirements, and we try to provide some collaborative time for principals to hear what other principals are doing. Um, you need to have a functioning leadership team. Um, you need to have you need to meet at least three hours a month. It could be one point. We recommend uh, hour and a half meetings um, twice a month uh, for ten months. That is that's what the evidence based research is showing. Uh, that that's what it takes to have a functional um, operating uh, leadership team. You need to have your meeting agenda and minutes linked um, to grant and grant for me and complete and submit your FY25 application by 1031. We really want that to be, because if you wait too long, you're already in the middle of the school year. And then it's really essential that you have communication with your school leadership coach. They're there to help and support you. I'm hoping to have those assigned by um, July 1st as well. Um, and so that's kind of the general requirements for tier three. And then the memo of understanding, uh, this is, here's just a real quick screenshot. I'm hoping to have that out to you guys, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, we did make some revisions to it. So working on those revisions right now, um, and that's where, that's why it's a little bit delayed, but it includes the, includes a, a workflow of like how you want to move along through the, the application process. It includes resources. It talks about what's required for substantial approval. It talks about what's required for final approval. It does a year at a glance which kind of gives you an idea of what you should be doing each um, month during the year. It talks about what the SCA, ESCA responsibilities are. Um, um, SAU, um, SEA and so SEA, ESEA, I need to um, fix that. SAU superintendent responsibilities, um, school principal responsibilities, school leadership team responsibilities, school leadership coach responsibilities, and then so a consent that just allows um, these funds to be used um, for school coaching, and then a signature page. So all that needs to be completed and uploaded before substantial approval can um, occur. And this will be sent to you. Um, uh, it will be sent to you when it's been revised. And we're trying to decide if we want to do it through DocuSign or if we want to just have you guys upload it as PDF. So we're still working on that. Um, and then that's it. That we just are resources um, for you, um, how to stay connected with the DOE and um, our contact information. And then uh, questions that you have for me, um, summer planning grants, the MOU, allocation amounts, anything in between. And I'm going to stop recording and I'll answer questions that you have.